welcome to Shamba Shape Up Uganda. We are traveling all over Uganda to find hardworking farmers. We want to celebrate them while giving them the knowledge they need to make their farms more productive and adapt to climate change. We want to support them to get better yields and increase their income. We will see how farmers can benefit from our experts' advice and turn their farms around into a profitable business while learning from each other in so many ways. Join us on these journeys and share in the farmer's experience on the Shamba Shape Up Uganda! Uganda. We have visited a lot of Shamba throughout Uganda. Many farmers are telling us that the problems they have are because the weather is so unpredictable. The climate is changing and now the planting season is uncertain. When the rains come, they're either too heavy, too light, or too late. And that has become a problem for farmers. But welcome to Shamba Shape Up Uganda. Meet David and Esther. They have lived on the Shamba in Butuba village for over 25 years. Working hard together, they grow a variety of crops, but their main income comes from coffee and bananas. And that's the good news. But the bad news is they are suffering all sorts of problems and are desperately in need of some expert advice. So we pitched up and we got down to business. The challenges is I'm facing, pesticides and the diseases, that one affects us by reducing the production. The challenges we have in banana plantation it is the, this banana wilt and even the climate. When it is too dry, we get small bunches. Wow, they certainly need some help. So let's get started by taking a look at some of their problems. David and Esther understand how unpredictable weather patterns have had an effect on their banana crops. We have invited Dr. Godfrey Seruru to help us find solutions to boost their matoke production. Yeah. And how big is the plantation? See one acre. One acre? One acre, yeah. Dr. Seru, yes. we've walked around. What did you see? Yeah, first, it's a good plantation. Yes. And I want to commend him for observing yeah. some of the <laughs> agricult good agriculture practices, like planting in lines mm -hmm. and observing the spacing. Mm -hmm. yeah. That one was very well done. Good. But when I looked around, I saw serious issues which he must address. Okay. Like the black sugar talker disease is almost everywhere. When you talk about the black um, sugar talker, sugar talker mm. how can you identify that uh, the plantation is in fact? Yeah. Now for the black sugar talker, you look at the leaves. Mm -hmm. This is a, a typical example. Okay. The bunch is still very young. Yes. But it has lost all the leaves. So doctor, if it loses the leaves, then we're not going to get uh, the bunches. Yeah, the bunch will be very small. It's this leaf green that manufacture the food that fills the bunch, the fingers. So once the leaves are gone, the fingers will remain that size until you harvest it will remain very, very small. So the first thing we have to feed, feed, feed. the plant yeah. so that it comes out strong okay. and it will be able to fight off. After you've added manure, then you can prune. So how did it spread throughout his plantation? Mm. How does it spread? Yeah, now it moves from plant to plant, not necessarily that uh, someone has to be involved, yes. but the spores can move on their own from one plant to the next plant. Through the air? Through the air. Oh. Mm. David, when was the last time you applied manure? Uh, applied the manure during plantation. Plantation. How long that ago was that? One year. One year ago? Yes. Hey, doctor, what can you say about this? Yeah, from the appearance of the plants mm. and the size of the branches, it's evident that we need to apply manure. Okay. Whatever was applied at planting has been used up. Oh. So we need to apply <coughs> more manure at mm. this stage. You should apply manure at flowering stage. 
because by that time the plant has used up most of the nutrients, nutrients the, that you applied okay. and that happens the flowering happens around eight to nine months after planting oh, okay. Okay. when applying the manure yes you don't put it on the plant because the banana plant doesn't feed from where the stem is but it sends out roots oh, to the sides okay so <clears throat> we should put the manure a foot or more from the plant from the plant okay yeah and uh, we shall dig a trench around the plant. around the plant okay where we shall put the manure mm. then cover and uh, that one should be repeated after nine months. We cover this manure so that we don't lose the nitrogen to the atmosphere or to the air. And it's that nitrogen that helps us to give that, the banana leaves that mm. deep green color. Mm. And once it has the deep green color, it means it will manufacture the food that feeds the, fills the fingers. Oh. And it gives us a big bunch. Okay. Good. Mm. Its main problem is lack of nutrients. Mm. Nutrients. Mm, really. Aha. Uh -huh. David. Yes. I can see David you have Campbell. a problem here. Too many suckers. Oh. Yeah. Too many suckers and you left the mother plant. Yet you've already harvested. Now, David, here yes. yeah. we have to reduce the number of suckers. Okay. Because now this is what you planted. Yes. After harvesting, you are supposed to remove yes. it. If you don't remove it, it can be a source of infection and it can harbor weevils, which will infect the young one. Mm. If for this case, now this is what he planted, what we call the mother the plant. plant. Okay. The mother plant, you are supposed to allow it to produce two suckers. They will be very many, but you select only two mm -hmm. and kill off the others. Oh. For this case, the suckers which should be here is this one and this one as the daughters. Oh, yes. okay. Okay. A, and after you've selected, how do you select the daughters? you select on the opposite side. They should be on the opposite side. You did it very well. <laughs> they should be on the opposite side of the, mother, of the mother. Not together. Not like this and this. But this side and, and the other side. side. Okay. He did it very well. Okay. But now, once this mother has produced the two daughters, you don't allow it to produce another one. So this one shouldn't be there. The next generation should be now the two daughters, each producing one. Understood. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So now you can see mother, the daughters, daughters and the grand. grand. So you don't allow this one to produce again. So we are going to remove this and remove all the others which are growing from this. We should program it that maybe after three months, this one will be ready. Mm. So that at every one point, we have one of the all the, the plants having a bunch. A bunch. Yes. That means you'll be in continuous oh, okay. production. Okay. Yeah. When the weather changes, land both for farming and grazing for animals can be greatly affected. To make sure that our farmers get the very best advice, we've invited Dr. Brand, an animal production specialist from National Agricultural Research Organization, NARO, to join us. Dr. Brand. Tell us what you see. This grazing field is, is not a good one. Mm. You see, it is all infested with, with just pasture weeds. Oh. There, there are almost no good quality pasture that these animals are feeding on. And that's why if he maintains it like this, then it will be very difficult for him to achieve his ob objective of having more milk, milk production. production. Okay. So we aggressively need to change these grazing fields and I will be showing you how to grow very good improved pasture. We are now going to, to teach him, to show him yes. how we can plant the, the new 
new forages, especially napier. This is sugar napier, mm -hmm. very high in nutritive for the animals, with a very good crude protein, about 8.5%, 8, 8 which we, we want him to grow. Yes. And then after three months, then he will be harvesting it. Okay. And then he does supplemental feeding, feeding. For, his, for his animals. The spacing is that it should be one meter from plant to plant. Oh. And it must be in lines. How long should David wait for this grass to grow? The moment it is about three and a half months. Yeah. It will be very ready for harvesting. He can harvest it and then he starts feeding his animals. But you also need to be very careful because we've seen some farmers who tend to allow it to overgrow. Oh. And then they are coming at around four and a half months to five months and they are harvesting. By that time it would have overgrown mm -hmm. and the, the nutrients will not be very good for, for his animal for the diary. I'm so glad the fodder issue has been sorted out. Now it's time for us to look into something else. Building a cow shed for their animals. At the moment, their cows are sleeping outside and this is not ideal. Following advice given to us by Dr. Brian, we have started the construction of a cow shed. A good livestock shed should have a sloping floor that helps waste to drain away. A roof over the sleeping and feeding area to protect your cows from sun and rain and three separate troughs for fodder, supplements and water. Moving to zero grazing, this means keeping your animals in a shed and bringing the food to them instead of taking them out for grazing. They use less energy looking for food and this will help them produce more milk. The sun shines on the shamba where David and Esther have lived and worked for 25 years. But recently, they've experienced a whole lot of problems and turned to us for some expert advice. We have advised them on making sure their cows are well fed and healthy and to help issues around their coffee and bananas. But there's still more shipping up to do. Better get a move on. David and Esther have been growing coffee for many years and it's this coffee that has educated their children. They started off with a demo garden of clono coffee. But in the recent years, they have experienced pest and disease as well as drought. Andrew Magombe from Cafe Africa is here to have a look. Yes, David, yes. we've walked around your shamba and uh, we want you to tell us exactly what issues do you have on your farm? The black coffee, Greek brother. Okay. Mm. That one is affecting us too much. Mm. Mm. It reduces the production. The extension farmer gave us some drugs. We mm. tried to spray, but all in vain. And Andrew, what have you observed? From my movement in the garden, and what I saw was, uh, like you said, there are some coffee, there's coffee root. Yes. I saw some plants with coffee root disease. Mm. That one is a disease. Yes. Then, uh, correct, I've seen some black coffee tree borer. Mm. It's too much everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, you've mentioned that you noticed that there's a disease and a pest. Kindly tell us exactly what's the difference between the disease and the pest. The difference between the disease and the pest is that uh, for the disease, and for the case of a coffee root disease, mm. it is caused by a fungo, a fungo, a fungi, yes. which is not visible by our naked eyes. Mm. You only see the symptoms. Mm. But for the black coffee tree borer, it is caused by an insect. The black coffee tree borer is a small bit which you can see. It's a black beetle which you can see with your naked eyes mm. if you open up the tree, yeah. the branch, yeah. the infected branch. Uh, Andrew, let's start with one. Let's start with the pest. How is it spread? Okay, the pest here is the black coffee trig trig borer. borer. The trig borer flies. It is capable of flying and it can fly, in one flight, it can fly 200 meters. Just one flight. And that mm. is about the size of two football fields, the length of two football fields. And just imagine how close our gardens are. Mm. If your neighbor is here and another neighbor is here, it will <laughs> fly and get there. So that's one thing to note. Yeah. 
Uh, but most importantly, we need to know the conditions that favor it to multiply. Because when you are going to control, that's where we shall focus our attention. Mm. Mm. So very important to know. Mm. Uh, the first thing that favors the twig borer to shrive is the presence of host trees. There are alternate host trees like the Musizi, we are standing mm. under here. This is a Musizi, you see? Yes. That Musizi keeps the twig borer. And okay. even if you do all your control here, it will still come back just from the tree. Mm. Second tree is the Musambia. Then the third one is the Ovakedo. You, you, you can see. Yeah. Just look and see. All those trees are here. So that is the first source of, that, that you must take note of. Mm. Secondly, the bushiness of the, the coffee, of the garden, yeah. as a result of not pruning mm. and not desaccharying. Mm. So if you leave it to be so much bushy, it is encouraging the twig borer. That, con that environment encourages the twig borer to multiply. So a good coffee garden needs to have some light getting through. Yeah. And that will not allow the coffee tree borer to shrive. Okay, so Andrew, mm. how do you control this? The first thing is that move in your tree, in your garden, and when you see the drying branches, you need to prune them. Prune them, collect them in a container, and burn them outside the garden. Okay. Then secondly, remove the, the host trees, mm. the Musizi, the Musambia, and the Ovakedo. Ovakedo. Those ones have the pest. Then the three, go to the plant itself. Mm. The sucker, mm. the suckering and pruning, Remo the sucker, removing the excessive, excessive yeah. branches. So once that okay. is done, you will see the population of the pest being controlled. This is a coffee root disease. Okay. And like you said, the tree starts by yellowing. The whole of it progressively yellows, and then it dries, the whole tree dries. Mm. Okay. Farmers sometimes mistake it with a black coffee tree buara. For this one, the whole plant dries. For tree buara, selective drying of only the branches. That's one factor farmers should know. And uh, one thing that farmers should know is that it has no chua for now. So once it affects the tree, there's no chua. However, we can do their control, there are ways to control it or to manage it. Mm -hmm. The key to managing a disease is to understand how it is spread first. Yes. So let's do first things first. Yes. How does this spread? Usually, it is the farmer who spreads it using the, the tools he's using. Unknowingly, when you cut one tree, you work on one tree using either of these tools, either a secateur, a proniso, or another tool, and you go and work on another tree, mm. you have transferred the disease. And that's mm. one of the commonest way farmers do. The other method would be the, the, the infected parts that have dropped here like the leaves or whatever that have dropped. When you find an, inf an, an infected tree like this, which is showing symptoms of coffee root, and you, know, and you very well know that it does, has no cure, we advise, this is recommended to uproot and burn. You uproot the whole tree with its roots, then burn from this very area. You also have to gather the branches, mm. cut, cut them, and burn from the very point. Method two, disinfect the tools mm. before and after working on every tree mm. using spirit or jig. If you are to use spirit, this is spirit, you don't dilute it. But if you are to use a jig, you have to dilute it. For every five measures of water, put one measure of jig. Jig is more stronger, so you dilute it with water. Okay. So this is how we, you have to clean it before and working on every tree. Meaning if I work on this tree and I finish, as I'm going to the other, I must disinfect. Then the third method is plant resistant varieties of coffee. The government has produced and approved uh, improved varieties. Okay. Yeah, if you did that, you'll be 
on the right spot, on the right route to managing the coffee root diseases. As the climate changes, leading to unpredictable weather, we all have to learn how to be more efficient and productive. That means adapting to climate change so we can make it through the long dry seasons or the flooding, both of which are expected to increase as the climate continues to change. And Dr. Godfrey Seruwo continues to tell us more. Doctor, yes. many farmers are complaining about the climate change. Mm -hmm. What is climate change? Mm, climate change is where we have changes in the in climate compared yes. to what we, we already knew. Things have changed. Some time back, we had consistent seasons, mm -hmm. but right now, we don't even know when the season starts. Secondly, we get rain when we don't expect it. Then we get too much rain at one point and then no rain at all. Extended dry seasons and increase in pests and diseases. So all those are the results of climate change yeah. and they greatly impact on the farming community. Uh, climate change is affecting us in all sectors, mm. in the coffee, we don't get uh, the beans. Even the weight reduces. In the banana plantation, you find that uh, the bunches you, you have been getting mm. becomes uh, very, very little. Uh, doctor, mm. how would you advise a farmer like David to tackle all these things? Yeah, I think we go enterprise by enterprise. We okay. start with coffee. Yes. Uh, on the side of failure of the cherries to give very good beans, mm. he can intercrop with specific trees which will provide shade so that when the drought comes in, the trees don't suffer so much from the drought. He should also be vigilant and try to control the pests. Then for the bananas, he should do simple things like mulching, which can help the plant through get enough moisture during the dry season. Yes. Uh, doctor, thank you so much for that information. And David, yeah. we have a lot of work to do. We should just start right away. Yes. From what he said, yes. let's get going. Okay. David goes on to tell us how the drought has affected their crops. That is why we have experts to show us how to correctly mulch and make water basins that help keep moisture in our soil even in the dry season. Now we start with what we have. Okay. We already have these dry banana leaves. Mm. Mm. We are going to start with those. Okay. okay so we line it properly. Like that. Why do we put it very far like this? We don't want mm. pests to climb over the mulch and reach the plant. Secondly, as the mulch decomposes, it produces heat. We don't want that heat to affect our plant. Our plant. So we put it at least a foot away. Mm. Then That's we can also thing. make use of this napier. So we leave it like that. We have okay. observed our free area. Mm. This area should not have any mulch, yeah. but now we are free to cover the rest. The rest. The rest. The rest. Uh, so this is how the mulching should be done. Don't bring it very close to the plant. Okay. Mm. Another method of conserving moisture is digging a, a shallow pit in the middle of four plants. Mm. It, now we have that one, that one. So in the middle here, mm. we dig a shallow f pit of about one meter wide and a few centimeters deep, less than a half, a foot deep. And uh, in that, we can add manure and also we put all the other plant materials that decompose. When you do this, mm. during the dry season, these four plants will take advantage of this moisture and the effect of the drought will be less severe. Mm. 
These are just some of the techniques and methods we at Shamba Shape Up have found which can help you adapt to the changing weather and climate in your areas. By taking some simple steps to become more efficient and productive, you will be better able to get through the unpredictable weather and be well prepared for any climate change related challenges that may arise. Not only that, but with these steps, you will have learned how to adapt to climate change and be a better, richer and healthier farmer in the long run.